Hi, I'm Kristen L, or just Kristen. Welcome to my channel. I talk about science fiction, fantasy books, and the awards that go with them. Today I'm reviewing The Midnight Bargain by C.L. Polk. This is a book that was written last year and thus is eligible for awards this year. It has been nom nominated for the Nebula Awards. Um, she does have a trilogy that I believe the third book is coming out later this year. The first book is Witchmark, and actually I'm planning on starting reading that very soon, so if you want to read along with me and hear my thoughts as I'm reading it, go ahead and start that now. I absolutely loved The Midnight Bargain. It, it was, you know, it's not often that I read books like The Midnight Bargain where it's simultaneously like really fluff reading, but also like actually kind of deep. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think about the best way to structure this video. I'm going to try to keep to my usual setup where I give a spoiler free review and then warning and then go into a spoiler discussion at the end. Um, I think that for this review, I might actually do kind of an intermediate. So my spoiler free review should be safe for anyone to watch, no matter like if you're one of those people that you really don't even like reading blurbs, I try to like gear that for you because I'm like that. I don't like reading blurbs. I like to know as little as possible going into a book. So what I'm really looking for out of a review is what did this book do well? Um, is it worth picking up? Just is it generally well written and fun to read? I don't want to know details. So that's what I'm going to do in the beginning. And then I'm thinking of my intermediate it might, I might give more details about the plot and the characters in the book than I personally would want to know before starting, but still doesn't technically have spoilers about like what's going to happen plot wise and stuff like that. So we'll see how this goes. Um, okay. So spoiler free. I love this book. It was a Jane Austen kind of feel. It is a total fantasy made up different world. I don't even know if it's earth. I, it doesn't matter. It's a fantasy land. These places don't exist in real life. They never have. So these are made up lands and countries and people. And I honestly, I don't have a good idea of what these people look like. I don't know if they're white or black or maybe something totally different because it's a totally fantasy world or, or what. I was kind of going into this thinking, well, maybe these characters will be black because I believe that C.L. Polk is herself a woman of color. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but yeah, I was reading the, this book waiting to see like, are her characters also people of color? And I think, I seem to recall mentions of blonde curls, so maybe not. I, I really don't know. Um, she really doesn't explicitly say ever. Um, so the feel is very much Jane Austen or Bridgerton. The setup of the story is the bargaining season, which is just like Bridgerton, where in the beginning of Bridgerton, it's the start of their bargaining season. They don't call it that, but it's basically everybody, well, I don't think they call it that. Maybe I'm misremembering, but everybody who is eligible, who wants to get married, starts going to all of these social gatherings, right? To kind of mix and mingle and hopefully get paired up by the end of the season. And of course, as with any Jane Austen type of thing, there's very much like, there's, you know, sexism and misogyny. Women are very much, um, they don't have the same power that men do. And there's also a lot of um, classism where you're really trying to marry up. You're trying to maybe solve your family's financial woes by making a good marriage, or maybe you're concerned about not marrying down and, you know, bringing any kind of shame to your family, like you want to try to marry in such a way that you move forward socially and financially. And so all of these factors are very much a part of the world in the Midnight Bargain. Um, so, you know, if you like balls and dresses and just kind of enjoy that Jane Austen kind of feel, if you enjoyed Bridgerton, I think you're really going to like this. It's Bridgerton with magic. And I've heard it described that way and it's like, yeah, it's Bridgerton with magic. It is. But there is more to it, too. I I want to say that this is not just a complete fluff fantasy, you know, Jane Austen kind of nothingness, you know, because the main character is very much fighting the system 
and I love that about her. So it feels like it's not just purely indulgent, you know, but at the same time, it feels purely indulgent. Like it does not feel heavy. It does not feel, it doesn't feel like it's about suffragettes, you know, like, okay, tangent. I used to listen to this podcast. I just stopped because I'm not really a podcast person, but um, The Guilty Feminist with Deborah Francis White. And back in the beginning when I was listening to it, she, her co-host was Sophie Hagen. And um, so that was like a few years ago that I was listening to this podcast. And it's just, it's a great, great podcast. I do highly recommend it if you're a podcast listener. Um, it's Deborah Francis White and Sophie Hagen are comedians and feminists. And the whole point of the podcast is we want to joke and have fun and have a good time, but we're going to talk about feminism, but we're also going to approach it in this really humble position of we have these high ideals to be wonderful feminists, but we recognize that we have internalized misogyny and we mess up all the time and we might not always behave in a way that meets the expectations of, you know, a really true feminist, you know, we might still have hangups about our, our beauty or, you know, just like whatever, you know? <laughs> um, and so just approaching it in that way that like, we're doing our best, but we, you know, okay. Anyways, why did I bring that up? Oh, I brought it up because in one of the episodes, they were just kind of chit chatting and they were talking about how their, one of their fans gave them a documentary about suffragettes and Sophie Hagen's like yeah I like I hid that under my bed because I didn't want to watch any suffragette blah blah <laughs> and Deborah's like what no you don't like that and like Deborah's like I love watching all that suffragette stuff and just like Sophie Hagen's like yeah I mean like I realized that I should I, I realize that it's so important to our history and I like deeply honor and admire the suffragettes I just I don't really want to watch a boring documentary about them um so, I mean, like, Sophie Hagen, I feel you. <laughs> um, and so all of that is a very, very roundabout way to say that the Midnight Bargain does not feel like suffragette blah, blah. It doesn't feel painful to read, even though the situation is very, like, there is a huge, huge divide between the power that men have versus women have in this fantasy world that Seal Poke has created. But it doesn't feel heavy. It doesn't feel depressing. It doesn't feel whiny. It's very empowering. It just feels really, it's fun to read. So I highly, highly recommend it. I have heard that this did not work for a lot of people. I think a lot of people just, you have to like Jane Austen. Like you have to enjoy Bridgerton to enjoy this book, I think. I think if that's not something that already appeals to you, maybe don't bother with this book because that's really what it is. It's that world, that atmosphere with some magic added in. The magic is fun. The magic was not even my favorite part, honestly. My favorite part was the way that we were able to have lighthearted fun while also really digging into how to resist and how to be an ally and all of that stuff. So I think that's as much as I can say. Oh, I will also say, I listened to the audiobook for this, and Moira Quirk, Quirk, Moira Quirk um, narrates this for the audiobook. She is the same person who narrates Gideon the Ninth, Harrow the Ninth, and also Flora Linda on the Forty Staircase Tower, the Forty Floor. I don't remember the title, <laughs> but she has this like really delightful um, British accent that just tickled my fancy. So I thoroughly enjoyed listening to her read the story to me. Um, also, the way she says some of the names is interesting. Like, um, one of the male characters, actually, it looks like his name is Ianthe. At least that's, like, the way it's spelled and pronounced in Gideon the Ninth. But then in, in this one, she pronounced it Iante. So I guess she must have just been talking to the authors, like, how do you want me to pronounce those or something? So it's, it's interesting. Um, I really enjoy her pronunciation of everything. Just, I loved, I loved listening to this. All right. Moving on, maybe I'll do some content warnings before I go to the kind of the intermediate section. Um, content warnings, there is, you know, dysfunctional family, there's kind of, um, there's like abuse, there is, I mean, there's an enormous power differential between men and women, so there's horrible sexism, misogyny, 
Um, there is some violence. I think that's mostly it. So now, if you're a person that doesn't want to know anything more than that going into it, stop here. I'm going to get into a little more detail without giving any of the main plot points away, or I'm going to try to. Um, this is where I bring up my Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire book. Um, this book, I had to read the first two chapters in grad school, and it changed my life. It's so good. Um, Paulo Freire is a Brazilian educator, sociologist. Um, I believe he's passed away at this point, but he he kind of made a name for himself by um, teaching literacy to indigenous peoples in Brazil. And he was very successful. And then he wrote this book and it's about teaching literacy to indigenous people, except that it's not. It's really just a primer for revolution. <laughs> um, it's amazing. He's, um, he's really interesting because he is a Marxist and a Catholic, and he is just a very different Christian than you typically meet. He, um, he talks about how growing up, he just had this sense that there was something very wrong with the world and that there was injustice and it just really bothered him and so oh my goodness he talks about in this book particularly he talks about becoming critically conscious and he has a special portuguese word for it that i think it, he made up but it's i don't really know how to pronounce this like conscientization or something like that and it basically just means becoming aware of your reality so that you can seek liberation and so he very much divides the world into there are oppressors and there are oppressed and the oppressed need to become aware of their oppression. They need to recognize the reality of their, their situation because that's a whole thing. Like a lot of people, they're so submerged in this reality that they don't even see it. They just kind of accept it. And so I'm going to start applying all of these concepts to the Midnight Bargain because it's so easy. It's like begging to be done. I almost wonder if C.L. Poke wrote this book after reading Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So the main character, just right from the beginning, I don't feel like this is a spoiler, just right from the beginning, she sets out to establish herself as, I am a woman in the society and I have a certain fate awaiting me, but I reject it. I do not accept it. And I am going to seek to liberate myself from the situation. And so she recognizes that this is an oppressive situation that she is in and she rejects it. And so she's seeking liberation. So she's seeking to be free of that. And then there's another character too that's even, maybe going even a step beyond that and really wanting to change systems. Whereas I think the main character is mostly concerned about her own situation. Um, but then she's surrounded by all of these other women who are just as equally oppressed as she is, but are fully accepting of it, participating in it. And that's like, yeah, I think it's time to start pulling out some quotes. Oh, you ready for this? Okay. The oppressed suffer from the duality which has established itself in their innermost being. They discover that without freedom, they cannot exist authentically yet. Although they desire authentic existence, they fear it. They are at one and the same time themselves and the oppressor whose consciousness they have internalized. So it's like the internalized misogyny, internalized any kind of impression. I mean, impression, oppression. <laughs> As a woman, you know, just without even realizing it, um, automatically just kind of look to a man, a tall man in, in a group as a leader. And I might just not even like realize it or think about it, but there's something inside of me that is this oppressor, oppressor consciousness that assumes, well, this tall man is probably going to be a better leader than myself or any of these other women. So, I, okay, that's what I mean. Anyways, they are at one and the same time themselves and the oppressor whose consciousness they have internalized. The conflict lies in the choice between being wholly themselves or being divided. By ejecting the, the oppressor within, or not ejecting them, between human solidarity or alienation, between following prescriptions or having choices, between being spectators or actors, 
between acting or having the illusion of acting through the action of the oppressors. Between speaking out or being silent, castrated in their power to create and recreate and their power to transform the world. This is the tragic dilemma of the oppressed, which their education must take into account. <clears throat> I'm gonna read another quote. In order for the oppressed to be able to wage the struggle for their liberation, they must perceive the reality of oppression not as a closed world from which there is no exit, but as a limiting situation which they can transform. This perception is not a necessary, but not a this perception is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for liberation. It must become the motivating force for liberating action. Okay, so there are definitely examples of both people who have become critically conscious of their oppression and those who are still not. And so the author does a really good job kind of contrasting that and having that be part of their journeys. And then the other part, which this is maybe my favorite part, is that at one point there's a character who sympathizes with um, the main character. Um, and this is a man, so he is one of the oppressors. Whether he wants to be or not, he can't help it. He is participating in a system in which he has power and women do not. Um, so Paulo Freire really, well, maybe I'm just going to read. He talks about when an oppressor, a person that's part of the oppressor class or system, they're in a position that is privileged, that they can sympathize with the oppressed and they can feel like they want to help. But he has some words of caution. I'm just going to read this. Another issue of indubitable importance arises, the fact that certain members of the oppressor class join the oppressed in their struggle for liberation, thus moving from one pole of the contradiction to the other. Theirs is a fundamental role and has been throughout the history of this struggle. It happens, however, that as they cease to be exploiters or indifferent spectators or simply the heirs of exploitation and move to the side of the exploited, they almost always bring with them the marks of their origin, their prejudices, and their deformations, which include a lack of confidence in the, ability, in the people's ability to think, to want, and to know. Accordingly, these adherents to the people's cause constantly run the risk of falling into a type of generosity as malefic, bad, as that of the oppressors. The generosity of the oppressors is nourished by an unjust order which must be maintained in order to justify that generosity. Our converts, on the other hand, truly desire to transform the unjust order, but, so they mean well, they really, really do, but they do not trust them. The people being oppressed, they don't trust that they're actually capable of their own liberation. And trusting the people is the indispensable precondition for revolutionary change. A real humanist can be identified more by his trust in the people, which engages him in their struggle, than by a thousand actions in their favor without that trust. Those who authentically commit themselves to the people must re-examine themselves constantly. Meaning well is not enough. You, <laughs> you have to constantly investigate your own biases and your own internalized oppressor. This conversion is so radical as not to allow of ambiguous behavior, to affirm this commitment, but to consider oneself the proprietor of revolutionary wisdom. The proprietor of revolutionary wisdom. Like, I am better than you. I know how you can be liberated. Not good. Um, which must then be given to or imposed on the people is to retain the old ways. The man or woman who proclaims devotion to the cause of liberation yet is unable to enter into communion with the people whom he or she continues to regard as totally ignorant is grievously self-deceived. The convert who approaches the people but feels alarm at each step they take, each doubt they express, and each suggestion they offer and attempts to impose his status remains nostalgic towards his origins. Conversion to the people requires a profound rebirth. Those who undergo it must take on a new form of existence. They can no longer remain as they were. Only through comradeship with the oppressed can the converts understand their characteristic ways of living and behaving, which in diverse moments reflect the structure of domination. 
One of these characteristics is the previously mentioned existential duality of the oppressed who are at the same time themselves and the oppressor whose image they have internalized. Accordingly, until they concretely discover their oppressor and in turn their own consciousness, they nearly always express fatalistic attitudes towards their situation. <sighs> yeah. So the reason that I thought of this at all is that that, that transformation is depicted in the Midnight Bargain. That transformation from an oppressor, having sympathy, wanting to help, really meaning it, really meaning well, and then having to transform into a true comrade, a true ally who is communing in the same struggle as the oppressed, the Midnight Bargain does that. And it's like, I just, I was so impressed reading the story because I kept expecting like, okay, she's gonna like, okay, we're gonna go into spoilers now, stop. You know, if you haven't read it, just stop. We're gonna go into spoilers now. You ready? She never gives in. She is in love with the perfect man. He is handsome, he is rich, he is nice. But she recognizes that being nice isn't enough. She wants liberation and she holds out for it. And Ianti comes around. He actually engages in communion with her oppression and becomes oppressed himself so that he can fight with her. He actually accepts demotion. He gives up his privilege so that he can help her be liberated. And that's just like the most happy best ending I've ever read. I was so profoundly satisfied and happy that that's the way that the story went. Um, I am so glad that there wasn't a cheap like, oh, well, I guess I just want to be a mother and a wife and I can give up my dreams. I don't need to be liberated. He's nice. It's okay. She doesn't accept that. And I love that. So five stars for this book because it was light, fluffy, and thoroughly enjoyable. And it also was so good. It gets liberation. It gets oppressed people fighting the oppressor and the oppressor having to become oppressed themselves to help in that fight. I think that's all I have to say about that. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.